Welcome everyone. It's really great to see all of you here. And we're very delighted to have Dr. David Michaels to kick off our webinar today. Uh, he is an epidemiologist and professor at George Washington University School of Public Health. And his new book is out, The Triumph of Doubt. And of course, his first book is one of my favorite, which is Doubt is Their Product. And um, uh, I use it all the time. So Dr. Michael served as Assistant Secretary of Labor for Occupational Safety, Safety and Health in the United States from 2009 until January of 2017. And under his leadership, OSHA strengthened exposure standards for silica and beryllium, as well as um, uh, implemented many other innovative programs. So we're so delighted to have you here, Dr. Michaels, and take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you all of you for attending. Um, when Mary uh, asked whether I would introduce Yuka Takala, I was so uh, pleased and honored. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to introduce him, who's really one of the global giants of, of work safety and health. Um, unfortunately, I can't stay with you for the whole webinar because I'm scheduled to testify at a US Congress hearing, which is gonna be starting shortly on uh, strengthening OSHA and also uh, protecting workers who are exposed to COVID-19. Uh, but I do want to just say a few words about where we are right now in terms of worker safety and health and how Yuka's work and his words will help move us forward. You know, this is a very challenging time for workers and for the worker safety and health community. Uh, there is no doubt that across the world, millions of workers have been exposed to work at work to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and many, many of them have gotten sick and have died. We don't know how many, but the number is obviously very, very large. The pandemic has upended many work processes and work relationships. As lockdowns spread across the world, many workers, particularly in the service industries like restaurants, public transportation, well, restaurants in particular lost their jobs. Depending on their nation's social contract, some are surviving reasonably well, while others are destitute. Some workers, particularly white collar workers and those in technology and knowledge um, and financial industries can telework. And while they face other challenges and they're important ones, they're safe and many are not impacted financially. Other workers though, who provide medical and long-term care for our sick and for our elderly, who ensure food is on our table, who, um, they haven't stopped working since the beginning of the pandemic. And many of these workers whose work ensures that the economy functions and social needs are met are underpaid. And certainly before the pandemic were virtually invisible in many countries like the United States. The pandemic has shined a spotlight on these workers, both how important they are to our society and the difficult and often hazardous conditions they face. They faced before COVID and after COVID will face as well, unless we do something about that. Right now, because of COVID, there is more focus on worker safety than at any time in many decades. Our challenge is to ensure that when this pandemic is in the rearview mirror, we don't forget these workers, that they don't become invisible again. Obviously, people on this call won't let that, we'll try not to let that happen, but our societies can easily make sure these workers are invisible and underpaid again after this, this pandemic ends. So we must continue to advocate and organize to make sure that every job is a safe job, that every worker ends their workday as safe and healthy as they were when they started that day. And as we all on this call know, worker safety and health is global. We often think about narrowly, or people in our countries think about narrowly, but it is global. The same problems are everywhere, but resources differ. We need new ways to act while reinforcing older ways that are successful. Uh, Yuka Takala, the, our speaker today, has been at the center of developing new ways to address workplace hazards uh, for many years. Uh, you know, he's, uh, Yuka is from Finland, but he is really and truly a citizen of the world. He started out as a safety and health inspector for the government of Finland and teaching students in technical safety and, and health at Helsinki University, the Helsinki University of Technology. 
He went on to be the chief technical advisor for the International Labor Organization to the government of Kenya. And he spent three years in Nairobi and then did very similar work uh, for the ILO as the chief te technical advisor to the government of Thailand. And he set up the uh, Thai uh, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in Bangkok. Since then, he has held top positions in several global safety and health organizations and institutions. Um, at the ILO, he was chief of the, of the OSH branch and director of the ILO's Global Safe Work Program for 10 years. He went on from there to be director of the European Agency for Safety and Health, and then was executive director of the Workplace Safety and Health Institute of Singapore. And uh, he is now back in Finland, uh, active in, uh, at Tampere University and globally, of course. He's secretary general of the International Panel for Working Life, and he is president of the International Commission of Occupational Health, ICO. In short, six countries, three continents, six languages. He is a fabulous colleague and a truly lovely person. I'm very proud to be able to call him my friend. Uh, let me turn this over to Yuka Takala. Thank you very much, David. And, and having such a long introduction means that I must be very old. And I'm sometimes joking that uh, I'm the professional retiree. I've been retiring from the government of Finland. I retired from the ILO, retired from the European Union, retired from the Singapore government. But in fact, I never retired from occupational safety and health. So I think this is exactly the, 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 the idea. One doesn't have to stop working for important things in life. And I think uh, doesn't mean that uh, doesn't mean that somebody will have to pay for you or anything like, like that. You can work. And I think that's what we can all do whenever we have time and, and, and possibilities, we can do something better in the world. But let me go in, into my presentation. And thank you, David, for being present and, and I hope you are successful in your next uh, effort to get uh, things done better in, in, the, uh, in the United States. So I'll, I'll share my screen here. Hopefully you are able to see this now. So I'm talking about the injuries, illnesses, and COVID at work, costs, and social value of work-related harm. And I think this is something what is uh, sort of a mixture. What are the problems and what are the implications in or lack of occupational safety and health? So uh, I have some three different points. Some words of the ICO background, but I, what is may, mainly the most time-consuming thing for me for me today, and then the the idea of the work-related harm and social value, and some of the things related to measuring progress, policies, strategies, and and so on. So I think these are the three main elements what I'm going to cover today. I have no problem if somebody wants to to uh, stop me in in talking and if, if you want to ask something that's fine but it may have to be done to the moderator because I, I'm unable to follow any chats and looking at the, at the raised hands from this point of view but in any case after my presentation I'm more than happy to talk talk about this more carefully. So if you look at what is ICO all about uh, of course we have lots of individual members but equally we have a lot of uh, sustaining members, the one that I is apparently missing in that sustaining, uh, including uh, uh, Institute from Finland, of course, uh, Singapore, what I organized, NIOS in the United States and, 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 and so on. So, uh, and ERSST from, from Canada and, and uh, INRS in France and, and things like that. I think if, if I wanted to, if, if you, uh, one could summarize what exactly what we do, and that's a long story, but having three E's, ethics, having everything done in a proper way, doing you know, things that are right. Secondly, evidence, uh, scientific evidence and practical evidence as well, and engaging people around the world and, and helping people to meet each other and, and connect to each other. Our next major event is going to be in Melbourne 2022. We were supposed to have it already last, uh, in fact, this year, 
but uh, because of the Australian problems uh, or COVID and the whole world problem um, that has been pushed, postponed to 2022, unlikely to even at that time to have a physical meeting. Looks like we are going to have an online virtual meeting only because of Australian strict rules. They are unlikely to be open uh, even one year from now. And I think this is quite reasonable that we can have the Congress at that time uh, in, in the similar, similar way like we are having meetings today. So we are working on that and the following on that will be in, in Marrakesh three years later. So then, then I come to the idea of work-related harm uh, and uh, let me see if I can put this better now, okay now work-related harm and the social value. We have a number of different kinds of problems and work-related complications, including uh, injuries and cancer and uh, work-related other diseases, circulatory, musculoskeletal, psychosocial factors and so on. And there are a number of things that can be used in order to prevent those, starting from the government and, and going to the workplace level. I think what is important as well that it is uh, this we can measure some of those items uh, it's it's like with the nature oxford university just um, proposed that nature should have a value uh, otherwise people don't take it seriously but at the same time uh, safety and health is a value as it uh, as it is itself uh, and for example if i'm i'm in a really nice nature here I can put a price for the for the plot where, where the house is located. I have a price for the building. But really what is important for me in the nature is the whole environment. I can go and uh, pick blueberries in the forest and skate on the lake and, and, and ski on the, in the uh, fields over here on the tracks and so on. So this makes the value what is not measurable by anything. And it's exactly the same thing with the social value it, itself. So I think we have to talk about uh, rights and, and ethics and, and morals and, 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 and things like that, which is important. So not all of the safety and health problems can be uh, measured by money or market prices. At the same time, we can and we have to keep in mind that safety and health is at work is not only economically feasible, it's a basic human right. And I think this comes already from the from the times of Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt in the past, uh, at keeping things what what is uh, a high in, what, what what have high importance in our life. And clearly, this is important. If you lose your your breadwinner in the family, it is much much bigger thing than having having the salary lost by the breadwinner. And I think everybody will understand that. So this is the key point to keep in mind that. You, you have values that are so important that you cannot even, even measure. Of course, there are things like, like the European, European Commission and the European, Eco, uh, European Chemicals Agency, they put the value for what they call virtual statistical life. And that life is not something that is um, as a human value. Uh, the price, what they said, it's just decision, 4 million euro, that price is how much one should invest in order to uh, prevent that kind of loss of life. So for example, if you are in a traffic, you can build a roundabout in the uh, normal crossing and you may save number of fatal cases. You may have small accidents and, and, and fender benders, but at the same time, uh, you uh, prevent the life loss of life. And similarly in, in the workplace, if you can avoid one occupational cancer, you, one could say it at least in the European calculation, one could spend at least 4 million. And if you would put the, that 4 million price for every single fatality, I think that would be, the calculation would be really, really high uh, when, when we look at the, every single fatality caused by work. So then another thing is here is, oh, go too quickly, is that, uh, sustainability that cannot be simply that we are looking for some components of the 
sustainability, like economic component and environmental component and the social component of sustainability that will be important things as well. I think it's a question that what, what is the workforce producing? I think everything what we have in our life uh, is produced by the workforce. Our uh, schooling system wouldn't work without workforce. Our pensions wouldn't come up if we didn't have the workforce. So the workers are the ones who are pr producing everything. And if you don't have the workers healthy, safe and motivated to work for whatever they are, wherever they are, then we lose practically everything and we would shoot ourselves into our own food. And I think this is key important thing that sustainability means also that workers are keep, kept safe, healthy and, and, and well. The 2014 figures we're here, but then go right away to the 2017, and we are now looking at what are the next steps we are planning to update the figures for the future. And I think there's a gradual increase. If you look at the total numbers, these are still, I would say, that really conservative estimates. Some people have much lower estimates, but even these are, for me, pretty conservative estimates. So 2.8 million fatal cases in a year. And I think uh, it has gone up from 2014. It probably goes up again. Why? Because most of those cases come from nowadays from work-related diseases. I talk about work-related diseases because that's much broader concept than occupational diseases, but are normally the, the uh, recorded, uh, not notified, compensated accidents according to laws in different countries and, and, and regions. So, but work related are those what, what are still caused by work, but not necessarily always compensated. If you only look at the compensated problems, then those countries that have no real compensation system would be very safe. There's absolutely nothing there. Uh, and, but on the other hand, if you look at those with the scientific methods, with the epi epidemiological background and so on, you can identify the fraction of all diseases but are finally caused by work and by of course comparing those exposed to those who are not exposed and then you see what is the difference and you know how many are really dying in this particular the construction site or chemical uh, production or anything uh, or psychosocial factors okay they don't cause fatal cases coming to that after a while but then these numbers are really high if you multiply this 3 million, uh, to close to 3 million fatal cases already by the virtual statistical life, 4 million euros, which is a bit more in US dollars, we come to huge number of figure if we count in that particular way, but coming to the cost, cost later on. And clearly some of those are really big things uh, like occupational cancer and, and diseases in, in general but also big differences in the different parts of the world. So if you look at the Southeast Asia, for example, India is dominating the Southeast Asian, this WHO <coughs> classification, and Western Pacific Regional Office for WHO is dominated by China. So the absolute figures are high because of high populations in those areas. But you also see the differences in problems, uh, like for example, uh, if you look at Cancer, Finland is located here in the high income economies, United States is located here. So cancer is the biggest fatal, uh, biggest disease causing fatalities at work. Uh, then on the other hand, we have very little so far on the communicable diseases. We have small number of occupational accidents that are fatal compared to cancer. And second biggest thing is circulatory cardiovascular diseases at work. Uh, while if you look at Africa here, uh, communicable are very high here in the low, also, also in, in the Southeast Asia, communicable are very high. And these are the differences, while cancer is very low. Why? Because people don't live so long. So if, if we live longer, our, our problems also at work start becoming different. And now reasons for dying at work, suffering from work become different. So if we eliminate uh, much of the injuries or much of the communicable diseases, then 
long-term non-communicable diseases are taking over. And that's already visible here in China, where you can see that uh, the communicable things are low compared to those others. So these are uh, the differences in different parts of the world. If you look at the high income economies, uh, for example, if you look at the cancer, which is more than 50% of all fatalities, these are some of the numbers. They may be somewhat different and depending where you take, but these are roughly the estimates where we are, for example, for cancer uh, today. Uh, likely that cancer goes up again because uh, the cancer fatalities go up uh, altogether, not only occupation, but all cancers. But the same is likely to be with the cardiovascular, which are these also going up. Uh, uh, then it's, that's a bit more difficult to estimate also because cardiovascular disease is something that if you don't die of, any, of anything else when you are younger, you're finally able, finally dying from cardiovascular diseases. So you, you, you don't know, you may have accumulated exposures for cardiovascular uh, diseases, including work, such as night work, stress work, and, and, and things like that, what are st stress at work together with the night work and things like that. So that will increase the risk of cardiovascular diseases in, uh, as well as those what are, for example, bus drivers. They have no way to, to change the traffic. They have no way to change the clients, the customers in the bus. They have, they have to eat quickly five minutes and eat a hamburger at the, at the, uh, somewhere at the breaks when they are driving the bus and so on. So these are exactly the kind of things what, what you cannot uh, um, avoid in, in, in our occupations. But these are the kind of major things what we have. But of course, now the respiratory problems are going up uh, gradually. Uh, there are different ways. For example, here, here, the Swedes, they calculated different problems over here, like accident, stress, shift work, and diesel in engine exhaust at work, all of them welding, ionizing, and external tobacco, short, uh, uh, tobacco smoke. But uh, they came exactly to the same numbers. We came to the number of uh, uh, 4,200, and then the whole uh, Swedish uh, fork or the lower and higher value was between 3,200 and 5,500. So if you make those calculations, you get roughly that kind of figures. And we, we are pretty sure that high income areas like United States, we come to the same. We have much less data from developing countries. So we need to have proper studies also from the developing countries, not only for us to record, but for themselves to know better what are their own priorities. Uh, and one thing is, is, of course, to look at what are the direct costs caused by work. And this is much easier to measure. You cannot measure all the social problems and social value. But what you can measure, for example, Sweden here is pretty high. One thing what we have to keep in mind is Sweden is high uh, uh, compared to many others is that they have really proper uh, system for, for notifying, recording, compensating diseases. So if you look at the countries that have most occupational diseases in the world per capita, then we come to Sweden and Denmark. If you look at the most with our countries that have most accidents in the world, we come to Germany and Finland. And of course, this doesn't mean anything else than we have best information from some of the countries in those. But those who don't have any information, of course, they can show nothing. And they, they are happy to see that, OK, we don't have any problems because we don't have any, any uh, figures and we have no priorities for doing anything for that. So, so these are the key points to keep in mind. Not, not only looking at the fatal cases, but starting from the fatal cases, uh, these are some of the backgrounds why people are dying in, in the society. So these are the numbers here for uh, first communicable diseases, very low in the high income area. Uh, then cancer very high, particularly in the, in the sort of a, a second part of our working life. But those also continue you may die at the age of 75, you know, caused by asbestos or whatever, uh, but you still caused by work. And partly the same also for cardiovascular diseases, not only those who are at work, you may get illness just right once you are uh, retiring. 
still caused by work and the stress at work. And then we have other big things. Chronic respiratory uh, is growing up now, according to our latest data, particularly US data. You, you have wonderful information on how much work is causing uh, chronic respiratory problems, including COPD, asthma, and so on. So uh, COPD, asthma is in the higher end, 21. Six here is, is for females, for some of those who are not that, that much exposed. While on the other hand, some of the others come to those later on, but some of the others are causing cause particular problems to females. But some of these are particularly high for, for males. Uh, comp look, look into that uh, communicable diseases at the end and look at the next slide. This is India, for example. I'm going to have a, another con con conference tomorrow in India and tomorrow, day after tomorrow, so I made this figure for them. So much, much higher number of communicable diseases. And this is all communicable diseases. Of course, there are, some of those are, are caused by work and this is the attributable fraction. And some of those are COVID, some of those are COVID at work. So we have to keep th those in mind. Clearly then cancer is much lower because people unfortunately don't live so long that they would have cancer, but still cardiovascular diseases are high. And chronic respiratory also much higher in India than, than in, in, in our high income economies. Also injuries are high. Injuries are here on the, between say 20 and, and 35, then people start learning and then, then they are not anymore having so many accidents in every, any, everywhere in the world. But now these were the fatal cases. How, look at the carefully, look at the difference now between this slide and the next. The red lines are more or less the working life starting here in the 15 to 20 years and then ending maybe about 65, sometimes 70. Some people work for even much higher than including myself, uh, but this is another thing. So this is the values, the disability adjusted life years. Clearly, some of the stuffs are here, uh, communicable, uh, cancer, cardiovascular, uh, chronic, and this is for high income. But then we have two major things, but don't really create uh, fatal cases, but have really high work-related fraction, this uh, up to 30%, and musculoskeletal problems, even 37% in some calculations. So we have a high number of cases uh, and musculoskeletal and mental health, if you get ill, say, at the age of 30, particularly women who are getting uh, problems at work caused by psychosocial factors, they may come ill at the age of 30, but they will never come back to work. So, for example, in our place, we have cases every day where people feel, feel, uh, fall totally ill for mental health reasons, and come totally disabled to continue. And that becomes, becomes major social loss for them, but of course to the society. They don't produce anything and somebody else will have to produce in order to them to have some sort of decent living, still at least some living uh, uh, up to the end of their life. So these are the kind of things that may cause problems young and may continue uh, until uh, your, your own death. And if you look at the same thing in India, again, developing country, we have the same thing, somewhat less of mental health, musculoskeletal problems, uh, but chronic respiratory is major thing and major here communicable diseases in India. So we have to keep in mind the different kind of problems in different parts of the world. I think this is exactly what, what uh, David was saying that problems are the same, but people don't have the capacity and resources to make much of a change. And these are the big things we have to work on in the future and having better equity between the high income countries and the low income countries and in between. If you look, for example, the different Delhi numbers, so here in, this is from the European Agency uh, visualization, uh, cancer, while it causes lots of fatalities, less so in the disability adjusted life years because of good or bad, maybe more bad. People die quickly when you have, a, say, lung cancer. If you have mesothelioma, you die in a year or two. 
So you don't have the long-term suffering from that. So that means that the daily numbers are less prevalent than, than the fatal numbers. So what then comes to what kind of value we put on the fatalities com compared to other problems in, in work. Then the Southeast Asia, this is India is, is good um, sort of model for Southeast Asia here. We have less cancer, much more of, of some of the other things, uh, including uh, the, the musculoskeletal, the brownish here, circulatory problems. And the high income, uh, um, quite different already from, from, the, from the two different ones. So we, here we have the, have the cancer is big and the other diseases. We have to keep in mind that we have no real data so far for the musculoskeletal, for the psychosocial factors and, and mental health. Uh, but and this, this also includes the respiratory problems and, and, and communicable diseases. So this comes like a big, so in the next calculation, we may have more detailed calculations of the details as well. But it's much more difficult to find the data for those. So here is the difference between mortality and morbidity. So for the, for the high income countries, uh, the 52% mortality goes to 25% of, of uh, disability altogether. Uh, and I think uh, this is not an ideal solution either, but I think it highlights the point that that uh, it's not only the mortality because otherwise we wouldn't have musculoskeletal problems and and uh, musculoskeletal, um, the, the musculoskeletal and, and mental health problems at all. So then we come to the um, point what is equally important now and particularly important now the protection against uh, uh, insects uh, animals snakes bacteria viruses so obviously covid is one of those so of course we cannot eliminate the cancer we cannot eliminate accidents as such we cannot eliminate diseases we can eliminate the factors behind the modifiable factors behind and some of the modifiable factors, just examples, are provided here. So if you want to eliminate psychosocial disorders, lack of, lack of, uh, lack of, lack of control and, and uh, the control demand imbalance or effort reward imbalance and, and things like that are important things to, to measure the psychosocial disorders. And it's also indication of what can we do in order to to reduce the problems and, and, and related exposures. Of course, cancer, we have the carcinogenic substances such as asbestos and many others, passive smoking as well. Uh, but all these can be eliminated, not uh, a disease at itself, just like that. It cannot, cannot be combined together. And each of the problem is individual, some, somewhat different measures as well. So key point is the exposures. So what are exactly the exposures in, in particular uh, for, for these diseases or any other work-related problems? So going then further into the uh, numbers, what we had before, we made a, in ICOF, we made a quick calculation based on 2020 figures of, of COVID fatalities. And, and we came to roughly th attributable fraction about 3% and that we had about 2 million cases, infections in last year in, in the whole world. And, and 2 million and 3% comes to 60,000 people dying. So it's really rough and maybe different in the future. Why it's relatively small for the workers uh, in, in terms of fatal cases? Because most of the COVID fatal cases are with old age. And I think I should have one one particular slide on that one as well. For example, in Finland, the average life, uh, average uh, uh, age of death for those who die of COVID-19 in Finland was 84 years. And the average life expectancy is slightly lower for females and male, male, females higher than males lower. So 84 years is pretty close to the life expectancy. So that doesn't really shorten the life from that point of view. But that's because of those people who die, they have so many other problems already. They are in the old age homes and they get infections over there. 
and once they have other problems, they, it's more difficult to, to clear and, and make them say, uh, healthy and so on again. So that means that those who are, are dying, they are not really in the working age, but they are the old ones. And, uh, but then if you look at the fatality cases, and um, if you look at them here over there, it's adding the communicable diseases from 230,000 to 60,000. When you count this year, maybe about the same, I don't know, maybe more even, but uh, uh, that is still not a big thing. But what is important thing is that those who suffer, these are the working age people, and these are exactly the workers itself who are suffering from that. So this is the attributable fractions on the working age fraction is about 30% according to Italian compensation, compensation body. I don't think they, any of them are overestimates because they are already compensated. So they are likely to be underestimates here. But the attributable fraction who really got it from work, such as nurses and, and, and health staff and so on, was about 20%, 19.4% of attributable fraction. So this is much, much higher than the fatal cases. And that, that means also the disability thing is much higher. Uh, luckily, not that many have permanent disabilities, but the per temporary disability is really high for the workers. And these are high numbers and at, at the same range as, for example, musculoskeletal and mental health disorders, uh, we are, when we are talking about 20 to 30 percent. So these are the different things what we used for the uh, calculation, the attributable fraction of different kinds of diseases. Here we have the COPD was 18% and 21% for asthma. Uh, but that depends, of course, whether you are male, female, and where, are, where you are exposed and what kind of substances and, and so on. So these are coming from the Italian and Finnish data, but we may get much more accurate data in future. Now, this particular table is also showing that this is, again, based on the Finnish data because our colleagues in, in another university uh, have made this calculation. So the highest number here is uh, 3.6 uh, uh, the beta coefficient means that nurses, special nurses have a 3.6 times higher risk than those who don't work. But uh, often, and even WHO, they often they keep in mind that we have to make sure that health staff are well protected and should be priority. But that's not all. Of course, uh, even the health staff, I doubt that the surgeons or high-class medical doctors have that many infections. These are exactly the ones who are dealing with the victims and, and everyday contacts with, the, with those who are in infected. But then when we come here to painters and building structure cleaners, three times the risk of those who don't work. So if you compare, for example, there's a lot of talk about the British variant, it's about maybe 1.5 times higher risk of getting, um, getting the infection and maybe also higher risk of fatality, 1.5 times higher fatality risk. But working as a painter in the building or cleaning the building structures is three times higher. And many, many others here, we have personal care, uh, other health staff, uh, but also drivers and professional drivers, manufacturing, mining, and, and so on, uh, different supervisors of uh, travel attendants, conductors, bus drivers, um, taxi drivers, artists, and, and things like that. So well over here, two times bigger risk for those jobs and occupations. In fact, we, we found in Finland that construction sites are really so sometimes uh, the kind of uh, super contaminating uh, places, locations. And we have one shipyard, not only because of the, of the um, work in the shipyard itself, but also when people come, they are, many of them are migrant workers. They come from Estonia, Poland, and so on, work in the shipyard. And then they are staying in the crowded places. They don't want to pay much of a rent for the, for the accommodation. So they stay maybe five, maybe even 10 people in a relatively small 
flat. And then they are certainly not always taking care of themselves and maybe don't even have the practice. They don't have the culture to pre prevent themselves. So they are, are having high risk. And the same for construction sites, a lot of that kind of thing. So very important to keep in mind. Uh, and these are also sort of vulnerable people in the whole, whole life who are low paid migrant workers working in another country uh, than their own, far away from their home and families and so on. So they have no real option to properly, properly protect themselves. So the summary for this part was that occupational diseases are common, but common diseases are occupational. So almost any any jobs what we have may have some some sort of risks, and and if you get the disease, you may get it from work as well. Then these are whether it's COVID or any of the other things, these are very uh, important things to keep in mind. Comes close to the idea of, of uh, Bernardi Ramati. The first thing you have to ask it, where do you work? And that is very seldom asked by the medical professions at least today. So some of the real calculations, what we have only on the product productivity component, the productivity loss, but that's already a big thing uh, and this is calculated exactly with the idea of having the disability adjusted life years. How many years are lost because of, of, of um, uh, occupational problems? So if you have X number of life years caused by, by um, the whole population in the country or particular section of course in the country, then you can count that how much is the share of those lost years compared to what it could have been if everybody was, uh, everybody were happy and, and healthy and didn't have any disease whatsoever caused by work. And that, that came to these percentage numbers, uh, whole world practically close to 4%. Um, quite a number of differences here. Looks like the UK and Japan have the highest, uh, um, the safest places partly based on the fact that they they are in the industrialized country and they work in service industries. They don't work that much in construction. Uh, they don't work in uh, manufacturing that's moved to whatever Asia and, and so on. So that also the structure of the, they don't work in agriculture. They buy the products from elsewhere and, and so on. So I think there are good reasons why there are big differences. While the Southeast Asia Africa, Western Pacific and uh, are high here. Uh, also, if you count out Finland, uh, the own estimation was if you take the productivity loss only, it's 3%, around 3.34%. But if you count uh, Finland's own calculation made by government ministry of, of social affairs and health, employers representatives and worker representatives, the tripartite calculation, they came to loss of 10.6% every year. So that if you want to make a productivity gain, so that would be the easiest way to get gains, uh, losing at least a part of this, or hopefully a big part of this could be, could be eliminated by eliminating the exposures in the in individual, uh, for individual diseases and problems. So, uh, and the same same we made in a calculation in Singapore. Once you made a totally independent calculation, comes pretty close to the daily daily uh, disability adjusted life years. But where are those disability adjusted life years? Where are those productivity losses? Where are the number of dollars that are lost? And I think then we come to three major components in the whole world. These are the European Union, United States, and China. Right. Why, why United States and European Union? Because they have the highest number of GDP in the world, and I, a big number of so big big regions. So these are the, the three things. China may be less uh, high GDP, but because the GDP per capita, there are so many people around, so that comes very much because it comes very high because it's also a highly populated country. So that's three, three different regions in the world. Uh, come to equal to the combined total GDP 
of poorest 130 countries all together. So we could finance with the safety and health losses, we could finance the 130 countries everything, not, not only the losses of work, but loss, losses of everything. So if we save a little bit in our countries, we make a big favor. Of course, still we need the decision to help those other countries and support the other countries, but making uh, making the financial and productivity losses huge number what we could make savings and, and uh, even help others. Another thing is that you know, different thing what is equally important and sometimes very difficult to calculate, but for example, the psychosocial factors and, and uh, resulting mental, mental health problems in Finland come that about pension, disability pension receivers three quarters of them is caused by, by mental health disorders and psychosocial factors at work. And then 3% uh, of those in workforce are permanent disability receivers. And then uh, in addition to that, we have absences from work every day. People will be out for a week, for a month, for two months, still coming back. That's about 5% in addition to the pension receivers. So this comes to a huge number of people who are affected by that. Of course, what exactly is the work uh, component? Difficult to say, but it's a major part of the um, mental health problem in, in particularly high income economies such as European Union, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada, and so on. In the UK, they made a particular study on this, that then even compared to cancer, which we, we and UK, they made practically the same kind of estimates of 14 billion in, in a year caused by, by psychosocial factors, uh, no, caused by cancer. So compared to that, it was 70, between 74 and 95 pounds, which is much more in, in euros and, and, and dollars. So this is higher loss in terms of, of really productivity loss and, and finance loss uh, than, for example, cancer. I often use cancer because it's much easier to understand. It doesn't mean, mean that the others are less important. Sometimes the productivity loss is, is even higher, like here in the psychosocial factors. So I'm saying here that cancer is a disease but occupational cancer is an administrative decision. That, that you could, of course, cancer you can replace by different disease. It doesn't have to be cancer. It can be a respiratory problem or psychosocial mental health caused by psychosocial factors, mental health. Uh, so what is a disease and what is an occupational disease is an administrative decision. And that's sometimes people look at only those that are recognized, and that is usually tiny, tiny fraction. Even in my own country, in Finland, most of the mesothelioma cases are compensated and recorded 80, 90%. But lung cancer, which is much, much more common, only a fraction of those are compensated because medical doctor said, ah, victim, he was smoking, cancer, lung cancer was caused by uh, cigarette smoking, and they don't even ask whether asbestos had a factor over there. We know that asbestos and smoking together make the risk uh, either multiplicative or at least super additive. So they combine to each, each other and multiply the number. So roughly, if, if asbestos is causing five, five times higher risk, smoking 10 times higher risk, Together, it could be up to 50 times higher if you have both. And these, are, these uh, things are, are important to keep in mind. And you can never discriminate that, okay, this victim was smoking, so we don't pay any compensation. You should find out that was it caused by asbestos and smoking and then compensate. And for example, in many countries in, in the UK, in Finland and, and Sweden and so on, uh, that's exactly the case that it should not be eliminated uh, as an entitlement for compensation, but in practice, practice it is because they are not recognized and identified and recorded. 
these are the European numbers for each and individual country. For example, in in the UK, we came to 14,000. Uh, the global burden of disease came to much higher, 19,000. Uh, so depending on what, what uh, source you are using, but that's are roughly the case uh, per country what are coming in the whole European Union, 106,000 in the last estimate. And in the United States, according to this, could come to something like 40,000 or so in, in, uh, in the whole country. Depends also what you count, like, like the global burden of disease, they don't count sheet work, mineral oils, solar radiation, painting, painters, dioxins, things like, like what are not really substances are much more difficult to identify, but yes, they are still there, including welding, welders, and so on. So if you count all those, not only asbestos and, and silica and diesel exhaust, then you come also much higher numbers. And this is from the Carex Canada. You have not only the exposure, but you need to count, but also the number of different uh, uh, locations where the cancer is coming. So if, for example, uh, we look at the, uh, the different kind of, uh, now we know that lung cancer is caused by asbestos and, and the positions of, position of hierarchies that uh, mesothelioma, lung cancer, larynx cancer, and ovary cancer are caused, all caused by asbestos and, and should be compensated, should be occupational disease. But maybe five years later, we find out that yes, colon and colorectum cancer may be also caused by asbestos or, or pharynx cancer or, or stomach cancer. But there are some indications already that they may cause uh, breast cancer too, not asbestos, but rest, as an occupational cancer. These are some countries covered and some other countries not. So we have to count all exposures and all different parts of the body also what may be affected in order to get the best picture. And we are still far, far away from that. Uh, some of the numbers here which become the 120,000 in, in, in our calculation, GBD numbers would be that one. If we count, this is made by trade unions in, in, in European Union come to up to 436,000. That, that is also coming closer to the virtual statistical life. Uh, this is uh, vinyl chloride mono, monomer over here. So if you take all different factors comes four times bigger. So it's just the magnitude. What you count is what you get. And another thing that is equally important that if you are looking at the um, age when people are retiring, construction workers, say scaffolding workers, retired age average may be 50, 51 or so, while bookbinders, artists, they can continue until 75, 79 years. And if you count the average one, Big differences to, for example, Iceland, which has the highest retirement age, effective retirement age. Uh, there's a big difference with many of the countries, like between Germany and Iceland. If you would be able to work 10 years more, having better working conditions, of course, you don't say exactly what are these caused by, but clearly working conditions and working environment has a big role here. But then having 10 years more of a productive age that means uh, 10 years GDP adding to what we have now. So that comes much, much more. If we today have something like 30, 40 years of working life, it comes 40 to 50 years, then comes a big, big difference in, in the GDP produced every year in, in, in those countries. So keeping people at work, making keep people keep kept uh, healthy and safe, motivated, making that the work ability is maintained, identified already the problems when they are young in the working age so that they can continue at old age. These are the big productive factors and what nobody so far calculates as a loss caused by poor working life. And here's some, uh, Japan are really high, Singapore also high, but some others are much, much lower like Italy, Greece, uh, Belgium, uh, Spain, and so on. So, uh, and also the, uh, this is the employment expect expectancy may go below 30 years in, in some countries, while in, in Iceland it's 42 years, so that's 12 years more than 
an ISON. So that's a big difference as well. So here also one more balance of, of horror. Of, uh, what exactly are the costs compared to the measures to, to avoid the costs? So here we had the early retirement, sick leaves, accidents, permanent disability, presenteeism, and the, the what are here, training, uh, occupational health services, laws and enforcement, and so on. They don't, they are not any big investments. So the price what are being placed, uh, what are, could be obtained from here, one could move the balance over there on having more effort to this particular direction. So it's a huge difference between prevention and the negative consequences. This is also visible in, in for example, the United Nations Human Rights Council. They, they refer to our numbers uh, and uh, uh, then say that exposure to, of workers to toxic substances can and should be considered a form of exploitation. Uh, and this is the, also the basic human rights of here. So it is a human right. And that I already covered a little bit earlier that sing, significance of the uh, major component, the sustainability is that if, if we wouldn't have the workforce, we wouldn't have anything. And it's important to keep it in the sustainability that having sustainable workforce, healthy workforce from start to the end would be a, a really, really big material and social value. And um, often these are the UN sustainability, sustainability goals, uh, particularly good health, uh, that's uh, number three, decent work and economic growth. These are the key points, but practically, as we, uh, as we have workers in every section, uh, uh, our workforce goes through the, the, the every single case, every single goal of the sustainable development goal, quality, quality education. We have workers in, in the education all the time and, and having clean water. Workers need clean water and sanitation before they can work. So all these kind of things are also needing the proper action at the workplace level. So this is why, what was uh, my um, presentation. I'm happy to talk whatever we have time for that uh, from now. Thank you very much.